My name is Bob Larson. I joined a fraternity in actually my second year of college, not my first. I started pledging in September of 1987 and became a member of the fraternity in late October of 1987. I am Sherry Green. I am Robert Larson's mother. And I am Jack Green, the wife of Sherry Green, and Robert Larson is her son, makes him my stepson. I know Bob had more fun than we could ever imagine, and that's probably all I want to know. Every pledge seems to get a nickname. That happens early on. My nickname really shouldn't be discussed here because it's a fraternity nickname, but my nickname was Ja Rasta Kissy Face. And I think it was given to me because I, could, I couldn't hold in my smiles. Uh, very much, yeah, even when I was being yelled at sometimes, blindfolded. And I also had a radio show on campus, which was a reggae radio show. And so I had a nickname called Rasta Bob. So that nickname was given to me and it has stuck with my brothers uh, over the years. And you know, there's a lot of funny nicknames out there. Uh, but that one happens to be mine. Every pledge class has to go through this. Every pledge class knows it's coming, but it's called the road trip night. And what happens is, is the brothers will wake the pledges. And when I pledged my class, there was nine members of our pledge class. We had the biggest pledge class that our fraternity had ever seen. Usually it's four to six. We had nine people. And the road trip is the brothers would wake the pledges up at two o'clock in the morning. And strip search us that's to make sure that we don't have any quarters or any money or at the time um, any cigarettes or any recreational things uh, anything on us uh, that all we had on was clothes and um, that was it so they woke us up one night two o'clock in the morning we knew it was coming but we didn't know exactly what night or when so we had, you know, little quarters and dollars and things and people were trying to smuggle everything but all of a sudden one night they came in and they put us all into a van, blindfolded us at 3 o'clock in the morning and drove us about 18 miles into the woods. This is up in Lindenville, Vermont, or outside of Lindenville, Vermont, and then dropped us off. So here we are at 2.30 in the morning. We had no idea where we were. We had no cell phones and we had to find our way back to campus. Um, after walking approximately four miles, um, we somebody knew somebody that had a van that was available and uh, somebody got into that van and uh, borrowed that van and uh, drove us to campus and then dropped the van off down at the parking lot and uh, called the owners of the van and said that they could come pick their van up anonymously. Uh, I was not really privy to that part of it, but we were lucky to find a van in the middle of the woods uh, and get home. I'm aware of a few stories, but I've probably been told the cleaned up version of fraternity brothers out in the middle of the winter uh, stumbling around with too much to drink and no clothes on and having to find their way back to Linden State College. That was really the hazing situations that they went through which uh, which weren't great. Weren't, we, didn't, we didn't hear much about them, we didn't want to hear much about them. Well, I don't think I ever heard a lot about his fraternity life. He lived off campus in a, in a house. Uh, they had a structure. Um, they had occasional meetings. Uh, but it was really a bunch of guys living together off campus. When we had social gatherings on a regular basis in order to raise money for community events and fundraisers and singing at convalescent homes, uh, would occasionally, uh, on a regular basis, have large parties. And I think back now, and uh, I feel bad somewhat for our neighbors. Uh, but, 
Lindenville was a small town and at the time there was a police officer there named Harold who had been there forever and before him his father was a police officer. So Harold was probably 65 and Harold's father was probably 90. And we knew Harold quite well. He knew where we lived and we liked Harold and he liked us. Uh, we were always respectful to him. Uh, but he had a job to do. Uh, town ordinance had a quiet a quiet time of I think about 10.30 or 11 o'clock. So the fraternity devised a rotating uh, a rotating plan in which whenever Harold came by one of these parties and he did all the time uh, at 11 o'clock uh, he would ask for who's he would say who's holding this party and the fraternity through their funds would pay the fine for whoever stepped up to the door and said I'm holding this party. So we had a rotating list of people that would be responsible for the fine for noise in the nighttime and that was about a hundred and eighty dollar fine back then. Well one winter it was a December Friday night uh, close to Christmas before break I remember there was a party and Harold showed up at 11 o'clock and it was my turn to uh, get the ticket for the noise in the nighttime. The fraternity paid the bill, of course. But this time, Harold, when he got out of his car, he started walking up to the door. He slipped on the ice and he kind of fell and slid underneath his cruiser a little bit. And a lot of people that were at the door and on the porch were laughing, uh, unbeknownst to me. So uh, he was very upset by the time he reached the door, knocked on the door, asked who was holding the party. Somebody called for Bob Larson, which was me, to uh, present myself to Harold for the ticket, which I did, and he was so upset that he handcuffed me and said, well, uh, this is getting out of hand, and he wasn't rough with me, but uh, his father was in the front seat of the cruiser, 90-year-old father, and I was a little bit perplexed, but I certainly wasn't going to argue with the police officer. And my fraternity brother saw that I was being escorted into the car because Harold was mad that people laughed at him. He drove about a mile to his house, which was in the center of Lindenville, uh, let me out of the back seat, I was still in handcuffs, and brought me into his house and handcuffed me to a towel bar uh, in his hallway for about 40 minutes. He gave me a cup of coffee and I talked to his dad for a while. Uh, Harold calmed down and said, uh, well, this ought to teach you a lesson. And he uncuffed me and brought me back to the party, which was winding down anyway. The worst experience I had in the fraternity was when I was pledging, there was an opportunity, I shouldn't say opportunity, it was mandatory. Uh, we had to go to a brother's house, a full-fledged brother, we were pledges, named Mike Yan Yaninka in Colebrook, New Hampshire, and help his family on his farm for the for a whole day and it was very cold out it was the last thing I wanted to do so I hid in my room and they knocked on my door uh, they yelled they banged on the door and I acted like I wasn't inside and they knew that I was um, I don't know how they knew but I was and um, they basically said that I'll get mine later um, and then left for the day and I told them I was sick and they didn't believe me and I wasn't sick I just didn't want to work all day in the cold well I stayed in my room all day and when I finally opened the door at about 3 30 or 4 o'clock I, I knew that they had come back because I could hear some of my sweet mates at the time that lived in the same dorm area that I did that were in the fraternity I could hear them so I opened the door and what fell in when I opened the door was a severed cow leg. Uh, apparently they had butchered a cow and felt that they wanted to teach me a lesson and they actually, this cow leg still had meat on it and like skin and fur and it fell right into my dorm room on the floor. It was like a bad scene out of The Godfather. Um, coincidentally that cow leg kicked around our dorm for about two weeks. <clears throat> until maintenance had to remove it because it became a public health hazard and started to stink. So you've heard all my stories 25 years ago. I've turned out well. I do good things, do good by people. Have a great day.